uh, at multiple can levels. Can you hear me now? Kastin, we can hear you very clearly. You. Previously, okay, well, so thank God for that. Um, and I really do hope that Musharraf takes over soon because, uh, as you all know, I'm not meant to be moderating this uh, conversation. But uh, so long as you can hear me, at least that's a, that's a you know, a step in the right direction. And yes. uh, I hope that the single national curriculum is also a step in the right direction. So, Mrs. Ali, if I could request you to comment on that, perhaps, uh, to start the conversation. After unmuting yourself. G, after unmuting yourself. Can, did G, I think you just need to unmute yourself. Acha, while she's doing that, uh, 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 Dr. Hudboy, since I, I know that you've spoken extensively on this uh, subject, so would you like to uh, begin the conversation in terms of so the the what the the, the real uh, question that we're trying to answer today is that is the single national curriculum the proposed single national curriculum a step in the right direction or is it a step backwards? Well, since you've put it in a binary way, I will give you a straight answer, which is that it's a step backwards. Now. Let me amplify upon that. Education in Pakistan at the school level principally misses out on a broad worldview and second, on critical thinking and the ability to solve problems. Hmm. In no way does the single national curriculum address either of these. OK, so what is the single national curriculum? It arises from a promise by the present government that they will level the playing field for everyone in Pakistan. And that means giving equal opportunity to the rich and to the poor, to those who study in ordinary public schools, and those who study in madrasas, and those who study in private schools. Now, of course, the very top level private schools such as Beacon House are going to be exempt from this. And here I would like to know from Qasim later, a little bit later, how this is likely to affect Beacon House and City School and other schools which are in the, in the top echelon. But uh, so far as I know, the O levels and the A levels are not going to be affected by the SNC. What is going to be the principal effect is to join the, the ordinary schools, the ordinary public schools and the lower tier private schools to the madrasas. And there is going to be a uniform system of examination, which means that the same textbooks will be used. And this, of course, the same curriculum will be used. So the playing field is going to be leveled for that category of schools only. It will certainly not have any effect, but then we shall hear from you on that, Kasim, later. Now, here is what I see as the biggest problem of education in Pakistan. First of all, it's a tunnel vision that we give to our students. We tell them so little about the world that they are for the most part, unaware of um, that which they should know and which they do get and which students do get to know in other countries of the world. So there they're told about uh, geography, world history, world environment, and they are taught in a way that uh, they are uh, to become eventually world citizens. Here there is a vision that they have to become good Muslims, and it is in that way that they will become good Pakistanis. So this is one point. The second is that for, the, for, for all our educational history, 
we have concentrated upon the notion, we have concentrated upon students as if they are buckets to be filled with uh, knowledge, with facts. And so the student mindset is passive, it is receptive, it is not analytical. Oh, and is there a problem? No, okay. So the mindset of the student is passive, receptive, it is not analytical, it is not equipped to, to solve problems which are new, which um, are even slightly different from the beaten track. And what that means is that particularly in the sciences, we lose out. If we compare, let's say, the quality of our uh, matriculation or FSC papers with those of uh, equivalent exams, school leaving exams in any of our neighboring countries, we see that there is a very, very sharp difference between them. We see that uh, here it is education by rote and rote learning has been emphasized even more than before in this present national curriculum. Now, that is for the sciences, but when we come to other subjects, it gets even worse. So if we take Islamiyat, there has always been a large, well, basically it has been all about memorization, but now that quantum of memorization has been substantially increased. So they are required now not only to uh, do Nazra Quran, but also now to be able to read that with meaning. Now for a young child, this is an insufferable burden on the memory and on the amount of time spent in education. And now it is not just Nazara, it is also meaning. And now there are also hadiths to be, to be remembered and recalled appropriately. And further, there will also be various duas, prayers. So there'll be a dua for climbing up the stairs, walking down, doing this, doing that, before prayers, during, uh, before meals, during meals, after meals, a prayer for every occasion. Now, that's not what you teach children. That's stuff that they ought to be learning in schools. And so why are we imposing such a heavy burden upon students who already have such a huge amount of memorization to take care of. So now the consequences of all this is that Pakistani education is going to get less and less competitive as compared to what's around in the world. And you can see that in terms of the quality of manpower that Pakistan is now sending overseas. And look, manpower export is so important to Pakistan. It's the mainstay of our economy. It's what brings in all the foreign exchange practically, except for some from exports of goods. But that's small compared to what comes in from the Middle East, from the United States, Europe, etc. And now our people can't compete over there because they don't have that broad base. They don't have those analytical capabilities. And this single national curriculum is in no way going to help in increasing that. So if the government was really serious about improving education, it would focus upon the education, it would focus upon the examination system, it would remove or at least lessen the amount of rote memorization there. It would improve the textbooks hugely because the textbooks that kids learn from are absolutely awful. It would invest a lot into teachers training and make sure actually that teachers get trained in the way that they ought to be. So there's a lot that has to be done. Instead, what the government has done is it's taken the it's taken the zero budget solution. I mean, what does it take to modify a curriculum? Nothing. It's just a piece of paper. You don't have to do anything more than simply say, OK, this is what you've got to learn. So. This is, to my mind, I hate to use the word, a fraud. And I'll stop here. Dr. Saab, that's uh, quite an opening statement. I'm going to 
before i beg leave i am going to uh, just address your question regarding beacon house uh, so uh, fortunately or unfortunately uh, beacon house is not exempt from the uh, doctrine of the single national curriculum the only fortunate part is that i'm not sure whether it's been implemented yet or when it's actually expected to be implemented but i do know that the initial plan is to look at primary up to year 5 I don't think that uh, they are immediately looking at uh, secondary school, and uh, this is one point. Uh, the second point, which I'm sure Musharraf will be uh, talking about, which also we want to discuss, is whether this new document you mentioned, new piece of paper, which uh, you know does not require a lot of money, is going to end what the government calls the education apartheid in the country. And finally, Musharraf, before I hand over to you. Uh, i just want to take this opportunity to thank our lead sponsor ubl who has made it possible for us to organize this conference uh, thank you very much and uh, uh, musharraf zaidi saab the our moderator is now going to take over musharraf luckily you heard pretty much most of what dr good boy said so you can uh, take it on from here thank you ladies and gentlemen Thanks for filling in uh, so ably. Uh, my apologies to the honorable uh, the speakers and panelists uh, for uh, running a little late. I had some tech problems, uh, but I was privileged enough to hear uh, Dr. Hoodboy's uh, opening remarks. And I think I my plan was also to start with uh, Dr. Hoodboy because he's uh, taken a very a clear and stark position against the single national curriculum without me sort of responding to any of the things that he said i will do uh, some of that but a little bit later on when i come back to dr saab but i wanted to bring in uh, shanaz wazir ali uh, madam you've uh, you've been doing this uh, as long as anybody has and you've seen various movements and their efforts to implement coherence across the entire country so uh, a less uh, critical uh, view of the single national curriculum is of course that the government uh, of pakistan seeks to bring together uh, the whole country and raise uh, the standard of uh, learning in the country and one instrument that they think can help achieve that is the single national curriculum maybe talk a little bit about your view of whether the learning outcomes aspect of this we've heard a little bit on the ideology and i really want us to not focus singularly on that because all all three of you have much to say about things like uh the learning uh the crisis in Pakistan the massive apartheid in Pakistan I'll bring that topic uh to Imran Masood madam talk a little bit about learning outcomes and whether you think it's possible to improve learning outcomes in any way through a coherent single national curriculum <coughs> please madam you need to unmute yourself you'll have to unmute yourself before you start speaking thank you Uh, thank you very much, Musharraf, and I uh, did hear Dr. Parvez Hoodboy's views with uh, my usual interest uh, because I think uh, he is one of the strongest um, proponents for education and also uh, the, the sharpest critics of what is happening in the education sector. Um, uh, yes, I agree with you. I think we really we need to look at. Uh, what is the intent and purpose of this national curriculum and i would just spend one minute on what i see uh, it is essentially an attempt by a political government to say let's try and bring all our students onto the same level field of opportunity in terms of what they learn uh, hopefully at some point how they learn it which is pedagogy and to see that can we through providing everybody the same content the same skills and the same um, strategic learning objectives of competencies and understanding comprehension analysis etc can we build a, a mass of universal education that is linked through a common curriculum uh, in simple words they are trying to um, remove the barriers that have existed between the parallel systems of education and i think any discussion on education has to take into account that there are at the moment multiple systems of education in pakistan in addition to the o levels and a levels or the cambridge examination system you have uh, the standard public sector school system and within the public sector school system you have multiple categories of schools 
You have uh, the Islamabad schools, which are extremely well endowed, excellent facilities, well trained teachers, and higher level of tuition fee. You have the uh, garrison schools, which have, of course, a lot of uh, infrastructure support and fairly handsome budgets. You have the small little, what you call the Pila school, the little Kacha school way out in the remote rural areas. You have urban city center schools and some area schools. So the, the landscape of public sector is not homogenous. I think we really need to keep that in mind before we begin to talk about uh, what I call a common national curriculum rather than the single national curriculum. Then you have the private sector, and that is also granulated in so many ways. You have very high fee charging schools, you have mid-level and lower mid-level, and you have even schools that charge 400, 500 rupees for private sector schools, which are called the Gali and Mohalla private sector schools. You have those that are for profit, you have those that are not for profit, uh, you have those that are uh, denominational also in private sector, and then you have the vast array of uh, madrasa schools, which also have multiple categories. So when we are looking at a single intervention for improving learning and learning outcomes, I'm not so sure that that's so easy, really, uh, to analyze in, in very simplistic terms. Because one national curriculum is a major input conceived by the federal government in consultation with provincial governments, which is attempting to say that let's get all the children to learn the same set of concepts and skills at the same age level and same grade level. Now, how will it play out in all of these multiple systems? I think that's a very big question. Those schools that are well positioned can take the same single national curriculum and deliver it exceedingly well. And I would say that also to Dr. Pervez Zotboy's reservations, that the pedagogy will depend upon the quality of the school and the quality of the teachers and its resources. The national curriculum per se, in my mind, is a fairly good, robust curriculum, frankly. How it is taught is the question. What is the pedagogy used? What is the assessment system? What is the normative and formative assessment systems that will be used? What is the type of examinations that you're going to set? Yes, we've had a lot of rote learning. Rote learning occurs for two or three reasons. One, because our examination system has been demanding rote learning. So examination reform is absolutely imperative. Cannot introduce curriculum without examination reform. The second thing is, yes, there's rote learning because our teachers are not adequately trained to teach uh, in more effective ways that addresses the need of every child. So pedagogy and teacher training is equally essential. To my mind, I have gone through the textbooks of uh, uh, the proposed uh, syllabus and the curriculum, and there is not that much of a difference from previous curriculums. Uh, what I find is, yes, uh, there is some uh, reservation about overloading it uh, uh, downstream in the early grades with a heavy content load of Islamiyat and, and Pakistan studies. There can be a discussion about that. Uh, but I, I'm more concerned about the fact that a single intervention is being given this heavy burden of bringing about transformative change. That is not possible. So it needs to be buttressed by a multiple set of other interventions that has to take place. Uh, the second comment, and I'll stop there, and I hope that we'll get a chance to say, uh, and have a chance to say a little bit more later. I'm really concerned about the timing. You know, sequencing a reform uh, measure into a system across all these categories of schools at a time when we are really facing an absolute disaster in the education system because of COVID. COVID closures are pretty much around the corner. You know that a major meeting is taking place on Monday in Islamabad. They may decide to curtail the school and academic year even further. We have lost 60% of the academic year already. And that's an optimistic assessment. If we are going to go through the rest of the year with kids actually attending something like 25% to 30% max of school time, and remember that all kids are not going to school every day. They're only going to school 50% of the time. How are we going to bring in this very major new intervention? So I, I really think the sequencing and, and the timing and the pedagogy and examinations are, it has to be a, a cluster of interventions. And, and that is my real reservation. And of course, it's only going to be introduced in classes one, three, and five. And there's a language ladder approach in it which I actually support. And I believe that there is a language ladder approach that does work. 
So, so I think clearly some good, uh, some not that different from before, and and some areas of concern and reservations, uh, uh, Madam. I, I think uh, one thing that I neglected to do, I'm sure Kasim did it, but I think it's important I do it too, is just to sort of explain uh, how well endowed this group is to have this conversation. Of course, Pradesh Boy is known uh, for his. Uh, Sometimes, sometimes really, really biting critique, critique, but a critique that I think helps keep the conversation flowing. And that kind of critique is vital to a robust discourse. So I think, you know, his value in the Pakistani discourse over the last quarter century and longer, but quarter century is how long I've been following it, uh, is, is something that I think all Pakistanis, regardless of whether they agree with uh, Dr. Rudboy or not, should should value, and I certainly do, and I'm glad that he's part of the conversation. Shanaz Bazir Ali, I think if I went into her bio, we wouldn't have any time for discussion left. But her most, I think, epic sort of contribution was her role as the co-chairperson of the Pakistan Education Task Force. She's, of course, been education minister and senior advisor on education to multiple governments over the last uh, three and a half decades uh, and has been running uh, a charity sort of education concern uh, that, that, that her family has been running for many, many years. And, of course, Imran Maksud, who may be uh, not as well known because of his relatively lower profile, but what a lot of people wouldn't know is that a lot of the reforms in the Punjab that I certainly and many others give uh, much well-deserved credit to Shabazz Sharif and the people that worked with him. Uh, a lot of the foundation for those reforms was laid by Imran Maksud and Pradesh Lahi back between uh, the year 2000 and uh, two and 2007, uh, and and I had the privilege of uh, seeing Imran in action uh, at that time. Uh, so it's great to see him back in action as the head of the Pakistan Education Council. Imran, what is your view? You're going to need to unmute yourself, but maybe start off talking to us a little bit about this issue of apartheid. I think that a lot of the uh, elite or really expensive English medium private schools get saddled with the burden of the entire uh, sector. Uh, but at the same time, there is a degree of uh, fear that people have that over time, these elite English language schools have become uh, predatory almost. Uh, can we have a decent conversation while so many different sectors within the sector are operating? How do we deal with this issue of apartheid in education? Mm, uh, thank you, uh, Musharraf. Um, Curricula has always been a big challenge for every government and any government. I remember back in 2002, uh, when the curricula was the prerogative of the federal government and provincial governments had nothing to do with the curricula. We wanted to change the books, we wanted to change the curricula, bring in new books, bring in new advanced research-based curricula, but then we were not allowed. It was after 26 years back in 2004, that the curricular revamping was done after so many years by the federal government. And after the 18th Amendment, this responsibility was given down to the provinces now that we have the 18th Amendment in practice. This has always been an issue. Uh, there has always been a uh, kind of a discussion between the private schools and the public schools. To me and to my uh, knowledge and my information, the majority of the Pakistani students, while being in the private sector, as well as in the uh, public sector, they have been going through a similar common curricula, which was being taught in all the four provinces and even in the, at the federal level. Now, the only difference between the public and private was the English language. The private sector was doing English medium instructions and the public sector was doing the Urdu medium instructions. We thought this is the biggest, uh, you know, the barrier. This is a, a kind of a, a thing which differentiates the public with the private sector. Now the public sector schools were supposed to be thought as inferior schools, sorry to use this word. And the private sector, since they were giving English language, so they were thought to be the best students, you know, in our society. So we thought that we're going to be introducing English language as a compulsory language from grade one. That's what we did. And because it is all about the mindset, how people take Urdu medium schools and how people take the English medium schools. So English was brought in to grade one as a compulsory subject. 
and then we changed the Urdu medium schools into English medium schools. It took us about seven years to convert those Urdu medium into the English medium. We never wanted to have any distinction between the public and the private. We thought that we gave equal opportunity to the public school uh, students. And I said, did you feel that, did, did, just an interjection, just so that we can enrich this point. Did you feel that the in the Punjab, the public sector had the teachers that were able to execute that kind of decision? No, I'm coming to that point. And I will second what uh, Madam Shanaz Vazirali said. Now, curriculas are always designed after 10 years, 20 years. Everybody wants to bring in catchy and very advanced curricula. It's, it's kind of a framework which is given to the, to the provincial governments and to the federal government. And then they can design their books, their syllabus. Books are then published and printed, and then they're distributed to the schools. Now, how are you going to implement this curricula? It is only through the teachers. We do not have the capacity of the teachers training. We do not have even any training and the pedagogical skills that we are supposed to give to our teachers. I have been facing this issue for a very, very long time. And still we have this issue that people are not trained, the teachers are not trained. Can you imagine back in 2002, we were taking uh, teachers, we were recruiting new teachers who were not even graduates. So I had to bring in this new law where I thought that teacher has to be minimum a graduate with one years of professional education could be BA or could be MED. And then we recruited about 60,000 new teachers and that too on contract basis, because once the teacher is confirmed, he becomes a permanent uh, you know, uh, part of the system and then he's free, then he's not answerable. So we thought we we're gonna make them a contract teacher and their contract's gonna be renewable based on their performance. Now curricula and the syllabus, the books have a direct interrelation, a link with the teachers. Teachers are to be trained if you want a success, now, you know, this, this curricula is okay. I don't have any issues with this curricula. It, it deals with the sustainable development goals. In our times, we had the Millennium Development Goals converted into the SDGs now. It, 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 it has the value, the critical thinking. It has all sorts of those catchy words that we keep on using that. Now, my issue is, how are we going to implement this curricula in our schools? Uh, so the difference between the public and the private sector has to be finished in a way that you must give liberty to all these governments to use whatever the books that they want to use, which are to be passed by those boards. Now, when we talk about the Madaris, like Mr. Hudboy just mentioned the Madaris, um, I even dealt with Madaris. There was a campaign called the mainstreaming of Madaris back in 2004 when I was supposed to bring all these Madaris in the government net, have them registered with the boards so that their certificates, which they do the 10th grade education, could be certified and could be accepted by the government, uh, you know, the offices. But they did not agree to our proposal. They do not give sciences. They do not give IT education. So they are not affiliated and registered with the boards, with the educational boards of, of all the provinces. So they are left out of the government net. Once their student in the Madaris, he does about 14 years of education, comes into the market, wants to get recruited or wants to get employed. So people or, it, or those institutions, offices, they do not hire them because their degrees are not ratified and not certified by the Higher Education Commission. So they are out of the net. So the point that which is being discussed here, whether it is a step forward or it is a step backward, but I strongly believe that, yes, it is kind of a political intervention. Every government wants to fulfill uh, the, the commitments that they have announced during the campaigns. They wanted to finish the apartheid and they wanted to give a single common national curricula. I strongly believe that the entire students of Pakistan, uh, barring the OA level stream, were actually following a single national curricula already. Now they've brought in a new change and they want to now implement this curricula throughout the provinces, the books are being published already. It is going to be launched somewhere in February. And a few books are designed by same. The other books are designed by, by Punjab. So collectively, they are going to be announcing, uh, you know, uh, these books and going to be implemented. 
yes, it is a very critical state. We have just battled with Corona. We are still battling with Corona. We face this closure. We face this lockdown. Lockdown is already in the offing, and uh, the schools uh, will not, uh, you know, support this lockdown. Uh, we are having a dialogue with the provincial governments and. We're trying to sort of uh, convince them that uh, lockdown is not the, the solution to the issue. So uh, coming back to my uh, last comment, which I want to strongly emphasize upon is the teachers, the pedagogy, which is going to be very, very crucial. This curricula, these new books can be failed if you do not train your teachers. Governments do not have money. If you want to, if you are serious about education sector, put in money then. We've never ever exceeded 2.2 as a GDP share. We've never gone beyond 2.2, which is a big shame. So if you want to focus on uh, promotion of education, then you have to put in money by these governments. So uh, curricula is essential. Uh, we need to have good books to run our new, uh, you know, a good school system. And uh, uh, so uh, curricula, uh, has to be implemented, whether it is good or whether it is bad. Thank you. Thank you, Imran. I, I, you know, I, I don't think that was a final point. I, I'll come back to you. I think that, you know, what uh, the private sector, the role that it can play, especially the elite schools in terms of a wider uh, net of teacher training so that it's not just left to government, I think is an important point. And, and I'll make that point when I come back to you. But I want to take this to Dr. Hoothboy. And uh, Dr. Hoothboy, I want to read uh, or, or recite to you my favorite dua which is Rabbi Shrali Sadri Yawasili Amri Walul Uqtatim Millisani Yafqahu Qawli, which of course translated, uh, this is from the Quran and you know, translated, it says, Oh my Lord, expand for me my breast uh, and ease for me my hat and untie the knot in my tongue so that they may understand my speech. I, I share this with you and, and, and with the viewers because for me, you know, the this dua and many other duas uh, are, are not insufferable at all. Alhamdulillah, I, I feel really blessed that, uh, that I know this dua, I feel that it's important because this opening of my breast is really about uh, tolerance and affection and warmth. So even though, for example, I may really disagree strongly with Imran's positions, I want to hear what he has to say. And I don't want him to feel like he has to attack me when I ask him a question. The reason I frame my question with this, uh, with this preamble is my only uh, sort of complaint with uh, the critique, uh, especially the one that essentially you lead, and I think so many people look at you. So, so I think maybe questioning you on this front makes a little bit of sense. It's not at all to personalize it, but would it be more helpful, do you think, if the language and the tenor of the engagement on an issue like this, writ large, what the government is saying and what we heard Imran and Shanaz acknowledge, and I, I agree with this, is that there's a real effort that this government wants to extend in both uh, national unity, which isn't a bad thing. Of course, it can be bad. And so we should critique that part. And uh, the elimination or reduction of the gap between the haves and the have not, because there's six or seven different systems. I wanted to just ask you whether you are on board for those two generic sort of goals and whether the critique is you know, specific to certain aspects, or whether you think the whole thing is, uh, you know, uh, should be dealt with with a, with a cricket bat. Well, look, religion has never brought us unity. <clears throat> it's brought a lot of disunity. You tell me how it's brought unity to this country. You tell me what were those people in the streets of Karachi shouting, Shia Kafir, Shia Kafir. Is that the kind of unity that you expect religion to bring? But that's what happened to the debate. The debate is whether the Sunni national curriculum will make it worse. Well, wait, wait, wait a minute. Let me speak. If you emphasize religion from the very roots and say that that is the only thing that makes us Pakistanis, <clears throat> what's going to happen to your minorities? Are you going to trash them the way that you've been trashing them for the last 72 years? We ought not. to be damn well ashamed of ourselves the way we treat our minorities. Of course we should. But yeah. is the single national curriculum going to make this better or worse? That's really the question. Worse. Absolutely worse. Absolutely. But what's the basis for that the argument? The more you emphasize religion as the basis, the deeper you're going to get into this. But, 
Okay, can you, can you conceive of a uh, Dr. Hudway, can you conceive of an of a curricular effort in this country of the 2020 of Pakistan today in which you can uh, erase religion from the from the discourse? Because, because I was watching the images from Lahore and I'm sure you've seen them too. Uh, I don't think religion is receding from the public space. So I want to understand how you conceive of a world in which a curriculum that is sans religion is is implementable or possible beyond the theoretical space. No, I'm not being theoretical. You look at the countries around the world and they're very happy countries and they're not based on religion and they don't have religion in thrust down their children's throats. They are very happy countries. Like India? I, not, Which hey, country are you hey, talking about? Hear me out. Hear me out. I am not suggesting that we get rid of religion in Pakistan by no means. What I am saying is, okay, like the dua, dua that you learned, excellent. Learn that at home. That's where religion belongs. That's where it should be. Don't, for heaven's sake, make it the, the absolute basis of your education because then everything gets judged according to whether it is according to Islam or not according to Islam. And then you have the question of what is the true Islam? And then you have the fights between peoples. And now let's come to the single national curriculum. Can you teach how to say namaz to both Shia and Sunni in schools? You know, and I know, that they pray differently. And yet you expect that they will be trained to say namaz properly? Who will decide whether it is to be with your hands down or hands folded, etc., etc.? So that's a very, very dangerous track that we've gotten onto. And it's a surefire way for provoking controversies, for provoking fights between people ad infinitum. I think uh, your critique, as I said earlier, I think is not just valuable, but it's vital, right? And and everything that you've said, uh, I don't agree with all of it, but it, but it's but it begs repetition because people need to hear it and consider where we are today and how we got here. My my challenge to you is that the 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 issues that you're quoting and the problems that you're quoting are already alive and 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 well in Pakistan. The single national curriculum. A, didn't bring them into the discourse, and B, can't be expected to, in one fell swoop, fix, fix all of this. So when I look at the single national curriculum, and this is really what my, my interest is, I look at the general knowledge, one to three, the general science, four and five, the English, the math, and even the Islamiyat, and I actually find a lot of positive pluralism uh, that's being uh, taught across the board, including in Islamiyat. Uh, there's certainly more content vis-a-vis -vis Islamiyat, there's no doubt about that. But if you look at, uh, you know, somebody mentioned Pak studies, there's no Pak studies, there's general knowledge. And I went through the general knowledge curriculum, grades one to three. There's no emphasis on religion or on nationalism. It's it's really, a, I mean, obviously there's stories about folk heroes and, and national heroes, but I, I'm, I'm wondering whether a lot of us are maybe angry about stuff that's already happened and, and is happening today and aren't giving enough of a chance to the single national curriculum. Critique. No, it's not just uh, being angry. It's, uh, it's a worry that when you add fuel to fire, the fire will burn f more furiously. Now, in terms of curriculum, look, uh, Shana said this earlier and I... Uh, Imran Sahib said this earlier as well, that the curriculum, you know, it, it doesn't really matter all that much. It's how, it's, it's how you teach the, the topics that are included in the curriculum. It's how you evaluate. It's the infrastructure for schools. None of those are addressed in the single national curriculum. And so... I come back to this. What is it all about other than a great propaganda stunt? Tell me what's new, what's good in it. So, like I said, I mentioned the general knowledge and, and, the, and the emphasis on pluralism, and I've read through it uh, in detail multiple times. So, unless it's oh, changed. 2006 curriculum had just as much. Sure. And so, so therefore, 
therefore, if we're talking about the single national curriculum, the critique that you're offering, uh, I guess, applies as much to 06 as it does to uh, this uh, instance. And and so that's what's the I'm trying to figure out what the extra bit of uh, critique might be for. OK, the extra bit of critique is that in the examinations, the madrasas and the public schools, and I don't mean the ONA level schools, I mean the lower level private schools, the lower end ones, as Shana said, there's a whole spectrum of them. Well, all of these are going to be yoked together. So the madrasas, which rely 100%, 100% on rote memorization will therefore drag down the rest of the public schools to their level, which means that we're going to have no reasoning capacity left in any of our kids, the ones who are going to come out. So far, there had been some, but now that you're going to join everyone up together, I think that's the really big difference that is good, that this is going to make. Okay, I want to. I want to include. I want to. I'll come back because it's always so much fun. Uh, you know, sort of trying to uh, learn from you, uh, Doctor. I want to come back to uh, to you. But Shana, the to me, and I've heard Shafkat Mahmoud talk about this. I've engaged with some of the curriculum experts at the federal level and in the provinces, and tried to understand what they've done here. A, I think they've multiple times they've said that actually we're not uh, bunching together the low cost private schools. Uh, the ordinary government schools and the madrasas. And B, what they're saying is, if if anything, what we're trying to do is drag the madrasa system into the 21st century and initiate a process of mainstreaming the madrasas. That's why the single national curriculum and its timing is so vital, because it's concurrent or parallel to the madrasa uh, mainstreaming effort, which, again, we all know is, is ongoing. Of course, we should be worried about the risks that Dr. Saab has pointed out. But is there a way you can see this going well as well? Or is it just darkness and brimstone and fire? And I'll need you to unmute yourself before you speak. Thanks. Madam, we're, we, we, we can't hear you. You'll have to unmute yourself. That question was for you. Okay, so the control room might be at, maybe. Might be at, okay, maybe. all right. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Yes, um, mainstreaming of madrasa education has been the attempt of several governments. This is not the first one. It is an exceedingly difficult thing to do. Uh, for many of us who have been in government, uh, Mia Saab has been there, uh, Dr. Pervez has been very familiar with what previous government's efforts have made, and Musharraf, you have been very much an analyst and a viewer of, of uh, uh, the political economy of education. Uh, it's not easy to do. Yes, this is one of the efforts that this government is making, and I frankly think uh, uh, that we should support it to the extent that if you keep madrasas outside the education debate, that is far more damaging. It is better to bring them into the education debate, that's one. What I've understood from the discussions that have taken place in the National Curriculum Committee is that all madrasa students will take the board exams. Once this curriculum has been implemented all the way through class 10, 11, and 12, Right now, they're only going in a sequenced intervention of classes probably one, three, and five in the first year, and then they will move to the other stages. So it will unfold over several years. But after those years, all class 10 students, equivalent to class 10 in the madrasas in every single school, including there will be you know O-level and A-level students, everybody will have to be taking the same board exams, which is why we talk about the necessity for examination reform. I think this government is aware of it. I don't think it has done any serious work on it. And there is a lot of work to be done. And there's an excellent model of the Aar Khan University Examination Board, which links examination with teacher training, with pedagogy, with pra pra classroom practice, how to implement, the whole question of how to implement. The second thing is that um, I, the madrasas are a vital component, and they do educate something like over 3 million students. Now, uh, these students also have aspirations of actually getting jobs in the marketplace. 
And I have visited many madrasas and many of them have got computer labs and they are teaching science. Uh, they are teaching mathematics, physics, chemistry, science, etc. I'm not in a position to say that they are teaching it at the level which really good schools should be. But at least for the first time, you're beginning to see this change of adoption of computer science and science subjects in the madrasas. The third point I, I would like to make is that um, the uh, which Dr. Pervez, I think, is very rightly said that there's no question about it. Our pedagogy really needs attention. Pedagogy means teaching practice. So I think we're all agreed on that. Every educator has agreed on that, and that's not a big issue. Uh, the, um, my, to my mind, the question I asked every, every time when we talk about the single national curriculum is what is the problem that it is setting out to solve? Now, to my mind, there are several other problems that we need to solve and, and attempt to solve. What about six and a half million uh, kids out of school in the province? 23 million kids out of school. Where is the solution to that? What are we doing about out of school children? What are we doing about children who are in school and not learning sufficiently? What are we doing about poor continuation rates, after dropouts after primary school, dropouts after uh, upper, uh, lower uh, secondary, and then dropouts that do not continue to 11 and 12? So there are several resourcing, materials, and now IT and technology. Here we are talking about online. Here we are talking about reduced time in school. And I think COVID is going to be around for some time. We've lost one entire year. Have we made any effort to make sure that the government schools, at least in some way, in some phased manner, have we resourced them? Have we you know, look at, looked at how we can reach out through IT and give some IT access to students so that when we say student, uh, schools are shut down, they have some means through which they can actually attend online classes. I am not in favor much of online classes, frankly. I don't think that this home teaching and online classes has been able to really impart um, you know, any reasonable level of, of uh, instruction. Uh, there's a family with many children, many other members, uh, one ha handphone set usually, not an iPad, not an iPhone, and that's what you're expecting children to get their lessons from. So to my mind, Really, what is the question we are trying to answer? How are we going to improve the education system? Mia Imran Masood uh, talked about a multiple set of interventions in Punjab. I'm very familiar with it. I greatly appreciate the work that was done by him at that time. It, because reform is extremely difficult to implement. There are entrenched interests. There is resistance. And if you're not going to resource it, if you're not going to finance it, financial and non-financial resources, you can have the finest curriculum and it's not going to be implemented well. So I understand the concern. Yes, we need, I think, to promote pluralism, recognition of pluralism, diversity, rights of minorities. In my mind, I'm a strong rights advocate. I really think that it's really necessary to place it there. Uh, I have also gone uh, through the curriculum and the syllabus. Uh, by the way, Dr. Pervis, they are not teaching any namaz. The curriculum does not have any namaz. It has Ayat hai, usme sure hai, usme memorization hai, kai cheezum ki, lekin namaz ka usme koi is vakt curriculum mein zikr nahi hai, ki aapne is tarah namaz padhani hai. So I, it is a, a question of how much do we want to look at in terms of uh, a rational interpretation of what can be done outside of just uh, Islamiyat. Are we teaching math, physics, chemistry in the right way? My issue with the curriculum in Pakistan for a long time has always been that we don't teach history adequately. We just teach Pakistan studies. We don't have a sense of global history. And that to me is an isolationist tendency. Well, Why don't you we could teach the history of the world like we used to? Well, we, uh, I mean, you could go even further and say, uh, uh, you know, within Pak studies, you know, what version of Pakistan's history are, are we actually teaching? Uh, we keep fluctuating, and I think it speaks to you see, a uh, our uh, this, in the country, but also our lack of maturity, uh, Shanaz. I I, was, I say this that you know we are expecting the education system and the curriculum to carry the burden of the delivery of an ideology, of an ideological state, of um, a superimposed national identity, and that's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, and it's not advisable. In my view, it is not advisable to do that if you're going to relegate 
and actually dismiss pluralism and diversity, multilingual, multi-ethnic, multicultural Pakistan has to be recognized in that curriculum. But I, at the uh, so same time, do believe there should be one curriculum that every child in Pakistan learns. And if it isn't going to be in Urdu and regional or mother tongue instruction, so much the better. So I, I think that, sure. So uh, me, me, I'm Ram Masood. Look, I, uh, I make this argument myself. Uh, you know, I've written about it. I, I fully support. I mean, I don't, don't think there is any Pakistan if, if we don't uh, revert to Jinnah's pluralism. Uh, it's it's essential. You have a picture of, of the Qaid behind you. I think that the Qaid's uh, ideology in terms of how he saw the, ident the Muslim identity of South Asia as distinct from the need for that Muslim identity to bludgeon those who don't share that ident identity into submission. That wasn't ever uh, the idea of Pakistan and it can never be. Having said that, Maybe one of the faults, and obviously I'm sure that both uh, Doc Saab and, and, and uh, Madam Chenaz will, will have a reaction to this, but I want to get your reaction to this. We hear a lot about pluralism, and it seems pluralism, uh, you know, between the 97% and the 3%, uh, you know, is really the, the most important, and of course it's important. But what about class pluralism? Uh, in the elite private schools, kids that, you know, come in expensive cars and eat, you know, imported chocolate bars and speak English at home, study in those schools. Uh, we want those kids to have no pluralism as far as class and accent and exposure to poor children is concerned. And then for all the poor kids, uh, you know, who go to the madrasas, who go to the low cost private schools, who go to the government schools, we want them to learn about loving, uh, you know, loving the Sikh, loving the Hindu, uh, you know, and, and th that sort of a thing. Now, I'm deliberately framing this in a, in a slightly uh, pointed manner. How can, how can the single national curriculum as a, as a cause or an issue help forge greater class pluralism in, in, the, in the average Pakistani classroom? Because that's one of the arguments that this government uses. And actually, it's a reasonably potent one. Would you disagree? You'll need to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah uh, there has been uh, uh, several issues which uh, the society has been facing and uh, there has been a lot of discussion. Um, well, it, it's, it is easy to criticize and it is easy to even write about your views. But when it comes to implementation and when it comes to the ground reality, that's very different. Uh, the governments have several responsibilities. As an education department, uh, their um, sort of targets are very different. They, they strongly look into the enrollment issues, to the dropout issues, the female sector, infrastructure, out of school children. Now about the pluralism that you talked about. Um, it's um, just one single point that I also wanted to mention here because it is part of uh, learning process that I went through uh, on that namaz thing which was just been discussed uh, I faced a lot of issue in this namaz which was being taught in our books uh, folding hand and straight hands uh, this book went to the northern areas to Gilgil Biltistan where they agitated a lot like Mr. Udboy has mentioned and there were 60 murders which took place on this single picture which was illustrated in our one of our textbooks and so we had to take that page off that book and we said, do your own namaz at your house and homes. We've got nothing to do with, so practice your own namaz. Now, uh, uh, the class, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the, we talk about minorities and we talk about these elite schools and the curricula which is being taught in the public schools. And in the, uh, there was a big discussion in our, in our provincial assembly and people wanted that Punjabi should be the medium of instruction in our schools, whereas we had the uh, Urdu medium of instruction in Punjab. Uh, people said, get out of Urdu and start Punjabi, you know, instructions. We were trying to even get the English uh, as a compulsory language. So there's always been a, in a discussion between the haves and the have-nots issue, you know. Now the have-nots want to uh, be the haves and the haves should care about the have-nots. And um, so it has been a, a great uh, sort of discussion and all policies 
and all rules which are designed, uh, they should be based on a narrative and a, and a philosophy uh, which we you know, commonly discuss with each other. It should, it should not be designed or framed on a bias. It should be designed on a ground reality and a requirement. Uh, we, we require these uh, private schools. It is my own choice where I put my child in a private school in a public school. Why can't we bring public school to the level of a private school? Why can't we bring in uh, the metric system close to the OA level stream? Um, so, uh, so who announces this? That what is the best system here in, in Pakistan? So it has been a, a constant discussion. And uh, when, when we sit in these uh, policy issues now, the things which I have faced, um, you know, we have this National Islamic uh, Ideology Council which has been designing our curricula and about the minorities, about the um, religion and all the ethnic groups that we have. Uh, there has been a constant discussion at that level. And once you uh, include something in the curricula, which gives a little more edge to one ethnic group, the other ethnic group then protests. And then there are rights in, in, in the society and those ethnic groups then um, sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, blackmail on that issue and they use that issue. So I, I strongly believe in that balanced approach. And uh, the balanced approach is to, uh, we should add the world history. Why can't we have the European history? Why can't uh, we've been teaching uh, uh, Islam to the Christians? And uh, so we brought in the subject of ethics. And whereas uh, Islamiyat is always a compulsory subject, Urdu has been always a compulsory subject. Um, so at the policy making level, you need to understand the philosophy, what kind of uh, society that we are trying to achieve, uh, what kind of uh, people that we are trying to train, and what kind of books are we going to design, uh, the books that should have value, that should have, should have critical uh, thinking, and again, it is a combination of a good curricula with good pedagogy, with good teachers training and assessment and examination, evaluation. And, uh, and you can get rid of all these uh, evils that we keep discussing. You can um, give this feeling to all your students uh, that they are the most important students. Madaris, uh, Madaris uh, are very strong uh, people and they believe that their system is much more superior than ours. I mean, ours means that the government sector's uh, you know, system. Uh, I've been dealing with the, with the Madaris very directly on the mainstreaming of Madaris and they were not happy with the government. They don't even have any confidence in the government's policies. And they have a lot of, lot of resistance against, our, against the curricula of the Pakistan government. So what happens is that um, their students in the Madaris, uh, which are not registered with the board, so they are out of the, you know, the government system and then they're left out. The only way they can work or get jobs is back in the Madaris. They go as imams and they go as uh, teachers in the Madaris and all these, uh, um, these big schools and big banks, they don't take them as their employees because they don't recognize their degrees. Although they are very, very nice uh, students. They are very imanda, they are very punctual. They are nice uh, students. Um, the things that I mentioned here, all these things, I've been facing them as, as uh, while we were designing this policy. Um, uh, our teachers, um, they also are part of uh, ethnic groups also. They promote that sect and uh, they themselves are uh, victim of uh, uh, the society. Of Absolutely. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, uh, the way it's a very, uh, Imran Tav, it's a very complicated uh, yeah. spectrum. I, I, I have a lot of things uh, in my mind, but no, no, uh, it's very valuable. Very valuable. Um, I'm trying to connect my points with your major question. A lot of things uh, come into my mind. Uh, it's a difficult task. And um, it is, uh, um, it, it depends upon how you, how you want to see the future uh, coming up. Um, it is easy to uh, talk. It is easy to make a statement. But when it comes to delivery, it's different. The biggest challenge that I faced was that 
out of 63,000 schools, 40,000 had no boundary walls, no, no chairs, no desks. And uh, I had a workforce of uh, 650,000 teachers worked in single Punjab's department, education ministry, which is the biggest in the entire this country. And uh, all those teachers were not ready to teach. So we had to train them and books were not good. We had to reprint those books, republish them, have them delivered. We had to then announce free education for every child because Pakistan, Punjab had the biggest dropout in the world. And out of 9 million, 4 million were dropped out. Female education was another issue, another problem in the southern belt of Punjab. They would pull out the female students from grade five to middle class schooling sector. And we had the major massive female dropout in, in, in Pakistan was the southern belt of Punjab, yeah. where people thought that these girls should not be sent to the schools. It's a waste of time. So we had to give them incentives. Uh, when we announced incentives, just like uh, Madam Shanaz mentioned, the reforms that we went through, those are the biggest reforms ever done in the Punjab's history. And of all, give, by giving all these incentives, uh, free education, stipends, free books, we got 2.2 million new students in the government stream. And I thought that the private sector was very important. And the quality comes from the private sector. Private sector should be termed and taken as the biggest partners of, of the government. If we have a literacy rate of 60% uh, uh, in Punjab or about 50% in Pakistan, so half of the credit should be given uh, to the private sector. So private sector, public sector, the government, they do not focus on their own public sector. They go after the, uh, you know, uh, witch hunting of the private sector. So what is the, what is the issue of the government? You know, once the, if, if the private sectors are doing a wonderful work and they're not charged, um, I mean, they're not uh, taking any money from the government, they're spending their own money and they're giving a lot of quality. So these things which I mentioned, they, they come to us every day. You sit in those uh, federal capital offices in the provincial capital, and when you're designing a law or policy, uh, one single officer comes up and says, why don't we shut down all these private schools? Why don't we bring in the metric system, get rid of the OA level stream? There has been these kind of discussions yeah. and um, nobody cares no, about it's, minorities. It's, uh... You know, Imran, so, not to cut so, you off, but just uh, I think it's a really uh, it's a really uh, fascinating expanse of issues that you've detailed, and I think it's very valuable for for viewers to try and understand what a uh, executive decision maker in government actually faces uh, while we are sitting on the outside and discussing um, sometimes uh, largely philosophical points, other times really critical ones. Uh, we are well over time, but if I have the indulgence of the panel members, I wanted to give one uh, opportunity uh, to each speaker to address a couple of questions that have come up online. So with your permission, again, starting with Dr. Hoodboy, um, you clearly have a big fan following uh, watching online because this question I think was made for you. It was designed for you. You're going to love it. The question is, why don't we include Muslim history in our social studies curriculum? Why don't we teach our learners about the Muslim era? That's for Dr. Pervez Udboy. And we want, we want to hear you, Dr. Saab, we want to hear you. Uh, you need to unmute. You need to unmute. We, we didn't hear that. You have to start again. Well, if you teach uh, Muslim history, you're going to have riots, you're going to have fist fights, gun fights about what is the correct history. So if you go back to Khulfai Rashidin and what happened in those days, forget the later days, just those, that period of the four Khalifas, that is something that Muslims cannot discuss with each other unless they belong to the same school of thought. So that would be incredibly divisive. In, and in, in fact, even if they are in the same school of thought, as we saw this year, even within the same school of thought, there's a, it's very and difficult. And this is why, look, I've read Maulana Maududi very carefully. I used to read him when I was a bit younger. And uh, he most specifically says in his book, it's called Talimat. He says, Islam ki tarikh na padhao. Islam ki tarikh 
पढ़ाने से यहां सिवाय फितना और फसाद के और कुछ नहीं होगा सो मोस्ट सर्टनली डू नॉट टीच इट एंड at least doc sab at least at least on on this occasion i can say that i got you to quote molana modudi uh, in a public forum so oh, I, i'm going to pat myself on the back for that well look um, he he was a great scholar i have great respect for him as a scholar but uh, of course in terms of views um, uh, we are as far apart as can be what's the next question the next is for shanaz if if that's okay um i wanted to ask how will the new curriculum what well, this is not my question from one of the viewers how will the new curriculum ensure breadth with so many restrictions on content that can be taught these days it's kind of a linked question uh the restrictions on content are not just the explicit ones but also the ones we impose on ourselves given that we might fear that if we discuss something openly it might lead to riots as dr hoodboy just mentioned shanaz अनम्यूट करके जी मे बी डू इट वंस एंड देन लेट इट बी आई थिंक देर माइट बी अ लैग एट योर एंड ओके इज दैट राइट यू सी अ करिकुलम लेज डाउन अ पर्टिकुलर बॉडी ऑफ कॉन्टेंट in most cases when countries have a common national curriculum they define that as a common minimum uh, curriculum they don't put an upper limit on it so dependent upon the school the institution the student body you can enrich and supplement that curriculum and i think unfortunately in our situation because we have an education sector that suffers from so many deficits in terms i'm now talking of, about the large sector which is the pu- public sector schools they don't have the resources to be able to supplement and enrich and i'm not uh, too sure about um, the statement of the federal government on this but i recall that in the national curriculum committee when such a question was also raised that can the teachers teach beyond this curriculum uh the response was yes they can if they've been able to teach the content of the curriculum and they want to add material to it there is no restriction on that however to my mind the restriction is there because you don't have the teachers trained adequately their knowledge base is exceedingly poor and the resources are not available in schools where resources are available and let's say a chapter on uh geography is being taught or on water or on magnetism and if you have the resources to enlarge that concept uh, through additional material and resources certainly you can but i don't think that there's a restriction um however given the fact that um this curriculum is attempting to look at every child as though every single child is a replica of every other child you know in the system we are not you have millions of children millions of uh, different situations uh, context is different language is different cultural heritage is different uh, the experiential knowledge is different so it is going to be very hard to say that this curriculum should produce um, a, a student body at the end of the day where everybody is, has been able to learn at a certain level in a certain way we know that's not possible so i think that the variations of delivery of curriculum will have to be factored in they have to be factored in anyway uh, there are children with unique learning styles and they will have to be accounted for in the classroom uh, pakistan needs to resource its education sector finance it adequately fund it support it train it give it the necessary materials and yes then set the standards which dr pervez would boy talks about and i fully am with him with him on that that our education system should reflect the global standards of a good quality education sure absolutely so, listen uh, so we need to pitch ourselves and our resources there and that has not still happened absolutely and, and i think this thing, absolutely thank you uh, madam uh, final word to you uh, imran saab uh, with 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 this uh, provocation and question you know we keep talking about uh, we keep talking about 
you know, Raja Dahir versus Muhammad bin Qasim. I mean, that's kind of the old debate in Pakistan. But we have uh, children who are, you know, the subject of that debate that can barely do basic math and put a sentence together. So in some ways, you know, the, the, the education, uh, learning outcomes, the quality education, those kinds of issues have become hostage to a wider discourse. Uh, and and I think that's the context for the for the third question we have uh, from the audience for you, uh, uh, Imran Saab, which is that the with with the majority of teachers being untrained, how will quality be ensured in public schools through the SNC? Obviously, that's a question better framed to the to the founders uh, and the government itself, the founders of the SNC. But uh, how would you respond to that if you were trying to put together an SNC? My uh, my biggest challenge uh, when I was heading the ministry was the teachers' training, and obviously we had no money. Uh, we had no money to do uh, chairs and desks and toilets, and uh, it, it was an ignored uh, sector, education sector. But we gave it a focus, and we thought we we're going to get some money. So we had to borrow the money from the World Bank, and we got the money. They were our partners. We brought in a reform. And we started doing the brick and mortar, desk, chairs, toilets, fans, everything. But let me just confess that uh, we did not work on the quality sector. Uh, teachers training was a big challenge for me. And teachers training, trained teachers, uh, uh, we had no trained teachers. And teachers thought that the teachers training was a punishment because they would call in uh, men and women from far flung places to Lahore and would ask them to stay here for about five days with a very uh, uh, meager sort of a TA, DA. And the women wouldn't stop there, wouldn't stay there. They were not allowed by their husbands to stay in the hall. Uh, so we thought that we go down to them, to the union council level, and give them uh, on the job, on the spot, teachers training nonstop. Um, so CEDA came to our rescue and we got some money. But let me just, uh, you know, uh, my, 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 punching statement would be that we cannot run any school system, any education policy without training our teachers. We cannot have any success by any good curricula, any good new textbook, a balanced approach, but all these balanced approaches and uh, where all the uh, ethnic, the minorities, everybody uh, having a, a very uh, confident sort of uh, feeling but that feeling can only be translated into uh, on the ground is only through teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, teacher training is uh, very, very crucial. Uh, we have to tell our teachers. We, uh, we've not been able to do much on uh, teacher training. Uh, private sector has a lot of inbuilt training systems, which I really admire at times. We've been asking the private sector, and I will be asking the private sector to train the teachers in of the government and uh, giving their expertise and uh, their knowledge to train our teachers. Our, our, our teacher is, uh, by our I mean, the government teacher is very less paid. The highest salary in my times that we would give to a teacher was 6,500 only. And there was no upward mobility. They had no promotions. And they got stuck at the 14th grade and would retire after serving about 30, 35 years. Um, so my, uh, my dear Musharraf Sahib, uh, uh, the only solution to the problem, uh, you make uh, um, nice buildings, nice brick and mortar, boundary walls, perfect desk chair, perfect everything. But it is a teacher who matters a lot. It is a teacher who shapes the minds of our young children. It is a teacher who has to control the ethnic issues of our student. It is a teacher who has to create a balance. It is a teacher we need to focus on teacher and the governments have to spend I, more and more money on the education sector, sir. Mia Imran Sahib, I think that that is a perfect uh, note for us to conclude on. There'll always be, in a, any robust democracy and society, a plural society, there'll be a wide variety of views about curriculum, and I think it's very healthy for Pakistan to have that debate. But without question, regardless of where you are in the spectrum on the debate, teachers, 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 without much more empowered and capable teachers, which can only come about through massive